many of you have a dream? I know it's a silly question. Probably all of you are raising your hands. I mean, if it wasn't clear by the anime of flop that was Wish, each and every one of us has a dream deep inside. And we all desperately want that dream to succeed ever since we're like little kids and we first discover it. We nurture it and care for it our whole lives, hoping that one day it'll bloom into a beautiful display. However, as we get older, a lot of times people realize that sometimes they're never going to see their dreams come true. Whether because of hardships, fear, or negativity from others, sometimes those dreams just disappear over time. But for a select few that manage to hold on tight to that dream and fight to make it come true, the work can be a mountainous climb, a never-ending struggle that keeps moving the finish line further and further away. Only the determined few who actually manage to push through all those hurdles and make it to the end get to taste victory and feel like their chest is going to explode with pride. But after the joy and excitement, the question becomes not, could you do it? But was it worth it? Was what you made worth all the sacrifice and struggle you went through to get it? Or was what you made never meant to see the light of day. Well, today, we're going to both ask and answer that question by looking at a work that took 20 years to make. A movie from the world of New Zealand and a tale that asks what happens when you mix a human, elephant, and goat together in a tale of hope, slavery, and faith. So please sit back and relax as today on Wolf Tales, we look at the surprising film called Mosley. and welcome back to Wolf Tales, where storytelling runs wild. As I said in the opening of this video, we are looking at a story from a creator who spent 20 years on what could be considered his masterpiece, the Mosley movie. I say it this way because surprisingly, when you look up Mosley on its own, you come up with a British politician named Oswald Mosley who was a fascist. Remember, young writers, always research names before you use them for your characters. Taking place in a world similar to our own, Mosley covers the story of the Thorophants, a race of titan-like creatures who were 10 feet tall and went from standing on two legs to having their backs bent and being forced into servitude. Mosley is a young Thorophant who works on a farm with his master Simon, his wife Brea, and his son Rue. When Rue takes Mosley to a supposed secret location in a cave, he discovers depictions of the uprights, Thorophants who manage to keep their bipedal nature. But Mosley doubts they still exist and tries to keep his son in line with a reality check. But a call to action comes when Mosley realizes his son will be auctioned off like he was in a month's time. Now Mosley must go on a journey to find the uprights and get their army to free his family and people from servitude. As mentioned, director Kirby Atkins, who not only voiced Mosley himself, but also did a lot of other work in the film, spent 20 years on this impressive piece of animation. His daughter managed to voice Rue, and the two put in a lot of time and dedication to the film. But while it is fantastic seeing a dream come true, the question becomes, was this worth it? Is what has been produced a good piece of storytelling? And should they hold their heads up with pride or low with shame? In other words, is this a timeless classic or one that should be left in the dust? Well, as I said earlier, today we're going to figure out just that. So sit back and relax as we dive into the world of Mosley, starting first and foremost with its story. As a side note, I think we need to make one thing clear. If you want to go see this movie and not be spoiled by anything, put the review down and see the film first. I need to explain the entirety of the story to explain my points on it, and I have to go over the scenes from beginning to end. As well, I need to explain the different character designs that happen in the film, which is going to go over some pretty big spoilers. So once again, if you want to go in and see this movie blind, see the film first and then come back and take a look at the review. If it wasn't obvious, the story is either heavily inspired on purpose or accidentally by the story of Moses. 
There are heavy Christian references in this work, including just the title that if you swap a few of the letters around, Mosley becomes Moses. However, some of the other examples are that Mosley is separated from his mother at a young age, was enslaved as a child and separated, that Mosley in the end is searching for the aid from essentially God from a burning bush. The apples he grabs are similar to the silver apples of the Tree of Youth, which, fun fact, is referenced in the Christian children's novel The Chronicles of Narnia, and he's on a mission to free his people from slavery by first running away and then coming back. Heck, even if you squint your eyes and tilt your head a little bit to the right, in some weird ways, there's a familiar connection between Simon and Mosley, where Simon will treat Mosley fairly nice, however, he doesn't mind subjugating the rest of Mosley's people. Now, you may think the fact that I have a Pride Flag bookshelf in my back corner, as well as my thoughts over on the Chronicles of Narnia video, that I despise this story and think you should avoid it like the plague with my feather boy in hand. Well, you would most certainly be wrong. Though the feather boa does sound nice. Christianity isn't necessarily a problem in media. The stories told can inspire faith and compassion when told correctly. The only problem comes about those stories when the morals are kind of twisted to push an agenda that promotes harmful ideologies like, oh, I don't know, homophobia, racism, putting women under the servitude of men. I'm just taking a shout out in the dark that you all can guess why I don't really like a lot of those stories. Again, despite what I said in the review, I still love Chronicles of Narnia and the tales it brought. I just can't say it's a fantastic book and promote it when the words darkies describes any dark-skinned evil person in the book, which is pretty much all of them and that all the good guys are rich, upper-class white men of British descent. However, Mosley, surprisingly, doesn't do that at all. Yes, while I admit it's not good to see the only female character with significant talking role is pregnant and subservient or a figureheaded queen, it doesn't mean it's wrong. I know that's weird. Let me explain. The women in the film weren't told to bow before a man's will or were put at fault for talking back in any case. The time that Brea and Mosley fight, it's because Mosley is trying not to get his kid's hopes up and Brea is trying to inspire him, which is not bad. And while Brea didn't do much, she did actually take care of her son and the farm supposedly with Turpin helping out every now and then when Mosley was gone for a month while pregnant. Again, not a bad depiction for women, just not great either. It also had issues of being a little over preachy about faith and believing in the second half, and I feel kind of patronized a bit with the unrealistic expectations that any shaken faith for even a second would result in horrible punishments. But at the same time, it does make an effort to show that the punishments are kind of more connected to what the person does in that shaken faith, not the shaken faith. And it does actually try to make it clear that those punishments will very easily be fixed. Again, I don't have a problem with Christian media. When it can be done right like it is now, I will praise it to kingdom come. It's just when it has an ulterior motive, that's where the fear comes in. Besides the movie's Christian themes, there appears to be an attempt at putting high fantasy elements into the work, but unfortunately, it does not stick the landing. Easiest way to explain this is the lore of the Thorophants. The entire thing with the Thorophants is that it was two great families that were divided and when you realize that they were two great families that were trapped in each area and it was just that small population, it makes you be a little bit anxious about Mosley and his wife considering they're technically related. Kind of the way we all got confused about Simba Nala. On the flip side, it also seems weird that it never explained the whole one perish and one did not idea. The movie explains that the Thorfinn families were basically separated 
but it never explains why one stayed and why one left, except that just humans were coming and that's it. I would have loved to see something about maybe two continents that stopped hearing from each other, maybe a vision or something else, I don't know, just something would have been better than what we got. Heck, I would have loved to see something like the explanation they did in Atlantis The Lost Empire, where it explained that there was only a small population left because that's what was only protected in the dome, the inner sanctum. What we have instead is very vague and makes the whole lore clunky and feel unfinished. Plus, in some weird, strange way, the ideas of evolution and de-evolution that happen in this movie just do not make sense when they're explained. Somehow, the film wants us to believe that in a minimum of a few hundred years, a maximum a few thousand, that the group started to rapidly evolve and de-evolve so fast that one became infertile and one became an elephant goat thing. Neither of these things are explained in detail, and it just makes it feel, say with me now, out of place and clunky. Don't get me wrong, evolution can happen really, really fast. Look at fruit flies, after all. But it can't go this fast. And once again, this just makes the story jarring and strange. I've heard in some Christian divisions that magic is considered witchcraft and they don't necessarily want you reading it. I mean, look at what happened with HP there. But I kind of think they needed to use magic to explain it because it's the only thing that makes sense. Heck, make it a curse from God or something and basically say that because they divided or broke a pact or a marriage, they now have this. I don't know. Something is better than nothing. Because right now, that's all I think of this world building. It's nothing but just lazy, and I don't want to call it lazy, because clearly other parts of the film show tons of effort put into it. I just think maybe the creator of this work didn't have as much practice in the high fantasy style as he hoped, and he kind of fumbled it. And that's okay. We all have our strengths and difficulties in writing, and maybe his is high fantasy. I don't know. However, looking past all of that, I can say that the basic story is not that bad. It has a wonderfully strong structure of the hero's journey and some incredibly well done scenes. And I'm not going to lie, I actually got scared for Mosley in a few scenes. The one I really could think about is when Mosley is trapped in the pit and he can't get out because he has no hands. It was a creative scene because not only did it show Mosley how hopeless the situation was, it demonstrated that by using the Thorofan culture, hunters had been luring them in to get tricked and taken back with their horns cut off for probably years. The way it made Turpin and Mosley realize the truth at the same time with the traumatized Thorofan is absolutely amazing. It is a 10 out of 10 scene and one I definitely enjoy. Another fantastic scene I thought they did was when the Uprights and Mosley meet up and they realize he's on four legs. The horror at recognizing that they're the same species and what's become of their, as they put it, cousins or family down south is incredible. It's clever to see and absolutely gut-punching when you hear the words he is standing up. That realization on their face, the fear and the heartbreak is all too real. And I admit, I actually got pretty heartbroken seeing the auction scene, but also applaud them for being brave enough to have it. So many times that scene would have been, oh, he saved at the last moment. Oh, it never happened but they actually played out that horror because you have to focus on that when you're focusing on a movie about slavery, even if it's a different species slavery. It is done incredibly well to show the mother's face, recognizing there's nothing she can do as her baby's going to be taken away, and just the horrible realization seeing how this scene was written out. 
not only is it heartbreaking to see this, it's also beautiful to see that it was put in. And again, I have to applaud the workers because they did brilliantly. And finally, I'll admit, because it did get the wool over my eyes, the idea that the fact that the soldiers actually are not existing in the northern village and they're all elderly is actually really clever. I honestly thought they were going to be either peaceful or there was going to not be an army because they were snooty and racist. I did not expect that the reason was that all of them are old. So I'll say this, some things don't stick the landing, that's perfectly true. But overall, the story is very touching and I dare even say bold. As for characters and themes, I definitely have a few favorites, mainly because they were the most portrayed in the entire movie. Mosley and his son, Rue. Very clearly, the most effort went into these two, and that is both a really good positive and a negative. It's positive because you want your main characters to be seen as well-developed and give them the most time and attention in the story. Mosley is a wonderful character, as is Rue. So, what's the negative? Well, the problem is the film kind of just tells me that myself, as a woman, can really only be useful if I'm pregnant, because as soon as Brea gets, well, out of being pregnant, we see not long after Mosley gets her pregnant again. Cue labor on repeat as I go into a little talk from a woman's perspective. I would have loved if Rue was a girl, not a boy, if I'm being honest. Not because there can't be father-son stories, but because the only two women in this entire film do absolutely nothing. As mentioned, the queen doesn't necessarily fight in the end and is more just a figurehead for her kingdom. You could replace her with a king and I'm pretty sure nothing would change except somehow he would do more things than just sit and talk. Honestly, I think they just added the queen in because they realized they had too many male characters. Or maybe it was a pot shot at Queen Elizabeth considering what kind of country this was made in. If Brea did do something other than being pregnant, give birth, and just keep her head down, I think the movie would have been better, to be honest, but unfortunately that's not what we got. Again, in a lot of Christian media and tales, women are often a back seat, and one should expect this when they enter a movie that's mostly a Christian retelling. I'm just kind of sad it still happens in the modern age. Though, considering the creator was a man and it has been 20 years in the works, maybe I shouldn't have been really surprised it would be out of date with inclusion and representation. Plus, the other thing I probably should have considered is this wasn't a movie made for me or a story either. It was made for male representation. Mosley is a strong and determined character, matching the general hero's archetype. Rue is also your standard, innocent, hopeful kid who's kind to everyone and believes there's good in everybody who sparks the hero's journey. Simon is a bitter old man who's snarky and cold after the passing of his wife. Turpin is your typical, wonderful sage who gives the other characters lore and religious faith. While the women I'm not going to be giving any awards to, the men produce some excellent examples of positive male role models and a strong sense of different forms of masculinity. Although I'm not a guy, I am also happy to see some really good father figures come out of this film. It's become way too common that father figures in media are either horrible drunks, abusive people, or someone who's too stupid and incompetent to really take care of anyone. Seeing a working father who sticks with his children and cares for his family is honestly incredible. Very clearly, Mosley is no bandit healer. But he's definitely one of the top father figures I've seen in a while, if I'm being honest. He's got his anger issues, but he keeps them in check. He's realistic and tries to make sure his son understands his place in this horrible world, but he also works really hard so his wife and kid doesn't have to worry about anything if something goes wrong. And despite the fact he did back-breaking work, Mosley still went with his son to go see the cave to make him happy. He's kind and thoughtful, but also fights when he deems it necessary. Much like Luca, Mosley tries hard to bring positive role models for both men and boys. 
And again, while it's great to see that the media in today's day and age is representing women and non-binary people, thankfully, it's also important and terrific to see good male representation in a movie like this. I just wish it didn't come at the cost of representation for women. As for themes, Christianity is obviously a big part of Mosley. But there is another theme they tried to push quite a bit, which is tolerance. While the idea of tolerance in Christianity films is very common, it is a massive can of worms I don't really want to open up right now. What I will say is, in this film, Mosley does try very hard to push this idea that honestly is quite different than what I normally see, but it's way more damaging than what I've seen in certain things too. See, the Thorophants are supposed to be enslaved and oppressed people. They are supposed to be people who are in desperate need of help, who have been abused, enslaved for hundreds if not thousands of years. They have had to deal with horribly unspeakable treatment from physical and mental and emotional abuse to starvation, degradation, and that is all I can probably say on this video without this video getting flagged. So to have Mosley come back as an upright, look down at Simon, tell him that he's taking his family, and not do anything to Simon back is a stretch and puts the wrong message out there. I know what is trying to be said because it happens in a lot of Christian media of the idea of forgiveness and letting go and repentance and blah blah blah. It's the whole turn the other cheek ideology. But this doesn't work when someone is oppressed and enslaved. These tellings don't match up with Susie broke the vase when the people are being whipped, beaten, their horns lopped off, and their children stolen away from them. That is nothing about forgive and forget. That is turn the other cheek and you'll die. That is a point where you need to either beat it into the person that's not okay and or have them pay back something to the equivalent of what they owe you. Land, recognition of wrongdoing, a statue, money, whatever anything other than making it look like Mosley did nothing to save his people and just saved his family. In fact, fun fact, this was such a problem for audiences that the creator actually had to make an entire article explaining that Mosley was coming back to free his people. Again, I know what they're trying to go for, but it just doesn't fit in this case with a kid's film. Half mostly get Simon's house, claim territory, drive Simon off the land, have Bemis get his cart destroyed and find out that they're coming for Turpin. Maybe just something other than Mosley looking like he's absolutely backstabbing his people. Overall, besides the idea of tolerance and forgiveness kind of being botched, the theme of masculinity was on point, determination, and in some way, cultural degradation was alright. Overall, themes and characters were okay. Characters far better than themes. And just as how there are giant plot holes in the story, the plot holes seem to have come through to this side. Story aside, the animation was the highlight of this movie. Forget themes and characters, this has got to be the best looking part of the film. Although it's not necessarily Disney, Pixar, or DreamWorks, the film has an incredibly well done team of animators at its helm in my opinion. It is rendered wonderfully and just looks beautiful to see. The murals with the hands are honestly, hands down, the best looking scene in the entire film. However, I think some parts are a bit lacking, like the symmetrical trunks we get in the orchard scenes or when Mosley is running. When Mosley walks or any Thorfinn at that point, they look fine. There's nothing wrong with them. It's the running that's weird because they're running like horses, but the animal that they're based on, it appears to be, is an elephant. Besides the animal they seem based on, the Thorfants are a heavy duty pulling species, so they shouldn't be able to run that fast or bend their legs that much 
Instead, it should be a lot like an elephant's that just looks like a really fast jog. Again, I think maybe if they stuck more to the elephant side and study a bit more, we wouldn't have a problem, but the Thor fans are okay. In fact, despite the fact that they look weird when they run, the species does get a positive from me because it is a combination of elephant, goat, and humanoid and does make the species stand out. They are colorful and creative, but the problem comes with their mouth. I know it's weird, but animals usually have their mouths open up as wide to the back of their nostril and even a little bit beyond. It helps showcase that larger muzzle and makes them showcase off their more animalistic sides. However, Mosley and the other Thorofan's mouth are more human-like, which makes sense when they're upright, but not when for most of the film they're on four legs. Then it just looks really weird. It's kind of an uncanny effect where they took a human face and stuck it on an animal to try and make it an uncanny valley. Despite all of these unnerving, creepy effects, there actually was a film that demonstrated what they should have done far better that came out three years prior. And that film is Okja. A few years prior to Mosley coming out, a movie called Okja came out. It basically featured a hippopotamus, pig, and dog-like creature hybrid that, while I'm not lying to you, the Thor fans' design is unique, it kind of is very similar to the super pig design from Okja. And interestingly enough, I like Okja's super pigs better than I like the Thor fans. The super pigs have wide open mouths and have wonderful anatomy designs. They look and feel like they're actual creatures we're seeing play out, where the Thor fans feel fake and not really real. Again, when the Thor fans become upright, it becomes better, but it's still really unnerving. On a little note as well, I find it hilarious that when Brea becomes an upright, she suddenly has clothes on her that she didn't have before. And while it can appear this was just out of frame, I really find it hilarious that Mosley would make sure his wife was covered up and not his kids. I wonder if it had something to do with human adult anatomy or not. On top of the wonderful design of the scenes and the Thor fans, silence is a big part of some of the best scenes in the entire movie. Not that somebody can animate silence, just that many scenes that were made for the movie were wonderfully done by just being considered silent scenes. The expressions, the understanding of actions, all of it takes place in these quiet scenes. From when Mosley is studying in the dark section of the cave to the procession of hands, these quiet scenes are a sore sight for the media. And if I'm being honest, I am very happy they included. It lets the beautiful society of the Thor fans shine through. It allows for impacts of certain scenes to feel more, well, impactful. And if I had to do one other kind of little fun point, it also makes it so that the people who don't get a voice in the background actually get a voice through their actions. On a side note about the Thor fan culture, it is actually one of the best ones I've seen in a while in a kid's film. The architecture, mosaics, and lore are very well written. It's not perfect, but it's well done for a kid's film. Plus, some of the louder, more action-packed scenes are incredible too, like the golden god firefly scene. The swirling and design of both are awe-inspiring and intimidating, and the little particle effects from the fireflies just make it pop. Finally, the soundtrack to this film, though not talked about often, makes you feel like you're back in one of those old fantasy works. Basically, the thing you'd find in modern day of Aragon and in previous day, you'd find of something like Mystic Knights. Alan Mayren definitely did not hold back when he was producing these pieces and each scene feels incomplete without the music that is both pleasing and impactful to the ears. The musician really knew how to make the animation come to life with each unique track, 
And personally, my favorites are when they get to the village of Kinesareth and the background track known as Procession of Hands. It's simple, yet the film feels totally incomplete without it. And you can't think of another place for that music to be than other in Mosley. And you know, I think that's actually a really great way to describe my entire feelings about the movie. It's a simple story that everyone should see at least once, but don't expect it to hit your top 10 list. Admittedly, if you asked me to pick a movie for an epic movie night, it wouldn't be Mosley. I'd rather watch Prince of Egypt, Aragon, How to Train Your Dragon, Balto, and a few others. Heck, if we're sticking on the Christian side of things, I would rather watch Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. However, that doesn't mean Mosley is hopeless. It works as either a palate cleanser if you're doing binge watching of other media, or just possibly want to watch a simple story. It's an excellent film to put on for your kids, especially if you want them to see excellent examples of masculinity and some Christian tones. If you have a young son or a little brother or an older brother or a father or whoever, and you want to see a film that has great male role models, this is the movie for you. Just because it's aimed at more guys than girls doesn't mean it's a bad film. It just wasn't one aimed at me and that might explain my lack of interest. Despite all its shortcomings, I am happy I saw the movie and can tell that there was tons of love that went into making it. It took a lot of guts, courage, and hard work to push through and make this film be released not in the fastest it could be done, but in the way that made it as good as possible. Even if it took hard work and dedication for 20 years, I say what came out is something that they should be proud of. And honestly, kind of wants me to get the creator's autograph one day. Maybe Mosley won't go down in animation history as being the greatest of anything, but I would advise anyone who's a budding animator and storyteller to go and watch it to see the hard work and dedication that went into it. If everything I said got you interested, then why not take a bit of time and go watch Mosley yourself and form your own opinion of it? I dare say, with enough hard work and dedication that's been put into it, I think it might even become the new VeggieTales of animation. And I would even say, keep your eye out for more Mosley in the future. Apparently, the creator of the work seems to be trying to make a novel series out of it and releasing it sometime in the future once he's done. Who knows? Maybe it'll be even better than the movie. For now, I'll be here watching Lil Sparks become big wonders with Mosley. And that's about it for me. As a reminder to help keep the channel going and growing, and because I want to show off my own hard work, keep an eye out on Saturdays at 2pm for Trothar Chronicles. I put a lot of hard work and energy into the campaign, and I really hope I get you all interested. Especially since you all get to see all of the riders, or our players, become legends in the making with their own dragon companion. And as for Wolf Tales, Keep an eye out for that as well as other surprises in the future, but know that the Trothar Chronicles are going to be a lot more frequent. It's just to help out so we don't have to deal with things like large gaps between uploads. Wolf Tales will still come out, and more surprises too, but if you could give Trothar some support, I would greatly appreciate it. Plus, if you make fan art or do other stuff, we'll give you a highlight in the next video. For now, I gotta go back to patrolling the forest and finding some wonderful tales to tell. Plus, the wind's starting to shift and get a little bit colder. That means time to prep for spooky season. Till next time, this is Silver Starling. See you next time you want to run with the pack.